Young will take a roll call to see if a quorum is present. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, when I call your name, please respond. Jody Novak. Present. Thank you. Robert Vondenacher. John Sherrill. Present. Thank you. Derek Costaneda. Present. Thank you. Ron Gritman. Yes, present here. Thank you. Hondo Judd. Mario Saldamondo. Rhonda Humbles. Nancy, I'm sorry, is Rhonda here? Nancy Allen. I'm here. Thank you. Scott DeBias. I'm here. Thank you. Ramona Simpson. Present. Thank you. Tim Connor. Uh, Sam Brown for Tim Connor, present. Thank you. Martin Lucero. John Woods. Walter Bouchard. Hi, this is Martin Lucero, present. Thank you, Martin. Walter Bouchard. Amanda McGinnis. Amanda's here. Thank you. Denise Kronsteiner. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Beverly Chanowski. Present. Thank you. Michelle Wilson. Mike Dendy, Steve Trussell, JC Porter, Dave Berry, Ed Stillings, Spencer Camps, Kim Butler. I'm here. Thank you. Liz Foster. Here. Thank you. Stan Ballone. Kristen Watt. Here. Kristen Watt is here, sorry. Thank you. Michelle Kamakawa. Kai Yumeta. Present. Thank you. Robert Forrest. Susie Stevens. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. A quorum is now present. The meeting of the MAG Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee is called to order. All members are participating virtually. Please remember to mute when you are not speaking. If you are attending by phone only, press star six to unmute. We operate our committee meetings in full transparency, giving the public access to committee meetings, materials, and discussion. The public cannot view the chat comments. As a result, we are disabling the chat feature in all committee meetings moving forward. If you need technical assistance during a meeting, please contact the helpline at 602-452 5095 or contact MAG staff. We appreciate your understanding and helping to maintain transparent discussions for the benefit of the public. At this time, I would like to introduce the new environmental director for MAG, Tim Franquist. Tim joined MAG on February 14th and brings a wealth of experience in air quality. So welcome Tim and Tim, if you have a moment, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Thank, thank you, Chairwoman, and uh, thank you to the MAG membership, and, and particularly um, Director Anderson and, and Deputy Director St. Uh, Peter. D just an honor to join the MAG team. Um, saw and heard a lot of uh, familiar folks I worked with back in my uh, ADEQ days as Air Quality Director there. 
Um, and most recently, I just came from uh, Arizona State Parks Board. M most folks know that as the Arizona State Parks and Trails. Um, there, I bring that up because one, it was just an incredible experience, but I also got a chance to be a regulated uh, entity uh, for a change. So bring, bringing a little bit of that to the table, uh, certainly spent you know, most of my time over at ADQ in the Air Quality Division um, as a regulator. So got a little different experience over there, um, kind of seeing what it's like to have to implement programs and, and find the uh, uh, budgets to implement these programs. At the same time, you know, it, it, as many folks know, um, huge advocate for the environment, huge ad advocate for the economy. So really excited to be here. Um, uh, as I see it, I work for every single one of the uh, uh, council members, every single one of you. So anything I can ever do to help solve a problem, um, bring some transpar transparency to an issue, you just let me know. Um, we can work on these issues together. Like I say, many of you have worked with me in the past. Um, I'm really excited to to work with every single one of you, um, especially a lot of a lot of new new people. So that's kind of me in a background. Uh, like I say, thank you again, and the chairwoman. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Tim. Again, welcome. So, agenda item number two is a call to the audience. An opportunity will be provided to members of the public to provide input through written comment to the Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee on items that are not on the agenda that are within the jurisdiction of MAG or on items on the agenda for discussion, but not for action. Members of the public are asked to submit written comments related to this meeting through the MAG website at azmag.gov comment and indicate for which meeting the comment is intended. Comments may be sent at any time leading up to the meeting, but must be received at least one hour prior to the posted start time for the meeting. Comments received prior to the deadline will be read aloud during the meeting. Comments must not exceed three minutes in length. A total of 15 minutes will be provided for the call to the audience agenda item, unless the Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee requests an exception to this limit. Please note that comments received for agenda items posted for action will be read at the time the item is heard. MAG staff, have we received any public comments? If so, please read them at this time. Madam Chair, we did not receive any public comments. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, we will move on to agenda item number three, which is approval of the December 16, 2021 meeting minutes. If I could get a motion for approval of the minutes. This is Ramona, town of Queen Creek. I will move to approve the December 16th, 2021 meeting minutes. Thank this you, is Scott. Go ahead. And this is Scott DeMars from Pinal County. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. We have a motion from Ramona Simpson and a second from Scott Tobias. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Okay, hearing none, a roll call vote will be taken at this time by Lisa Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, when I call your name, please state your vote. Jody Novak. I abstain, I was not present at that meeting. Thank you. Robert Vontenacher. John Sherrill. Aye. Thank you. Derek Costaneda. Aye. Thank you. Ron Gritman. Aye. Thank you. Hondo Judd. Megan Sheldon. Aye. Thank you. Mario Saldamondo. Rhonda Humbles. Nancy Allen. Aye. Thank you. Scott DeBias. Aye. Thank you. Ramona Simpson. Aye. Thank you. Sam Brown. Aye. Thank you. Martin Lucero. Aye. Thank you. John Woods. Walter Bouchard. Amanda McGinnis. Aye. Thank you. Denise Kronsteiner. Aye. Thank you. Beverly Chanowski. Aye. Thank you. 
Michelle Wilson. Mike Denby. Aye. Thank you. Steve Trussell. JC Porter. Spencer Camps. Kim Butler. Aye. Thank you. Liz Foster. Aye. Thank you. Stan Ballone. Kristen Watt. Epstein. Thank you. Michelle Kamikawa. Kayumeta. Aye. Thank you. Robert Forrest. Susie Stevens. Madam Chair, we have 16 ayes and two abstentions. Okay, thank you. Moving on to agenda item number four, update on the Burn Cleaner, Burn Better Winter Air Pollution Campaign. Presentation by Ari Halbert with the Maricopa County Air Quality Department. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, today I will be presenting a quick recap of the 2021 Burn Cleaner, Burn Better campaign. Uh, this campaign ran from November 2021 to January 2022. Uh, this was a multimedia campaign that earned more than 32 million impressions. Uh, next slide. So this time uh, we try to go a different route than previous campaigns. We still had our media buys with channel three, five, 12, Telemundo for our Spanish speaking public, um, but we really tried to concentrate on digital media. And the reason for that is we want to kind of go a different direction and try to reach a demographic that gets their news, not just from TV and radio, but um, from social media. Um, we had 15 seconds TV spots, 30 second TV spots, uh, radio, um, a lot of social media posts. And from our media buys, we also had web page takeovers, digital banners, um, OTT streaming. And uh, we also had the advantage this time around to do target audience. This means that we really ran most of our ads um, on TV and radio in areas that uh, experienced higher air pollution and uh, Maricopa County residents. Next slide. This is an example of some of the media co coverage that we had. We had Spanish TV ads uh, with our Spanish coordinator um, we did interview segments, uh, mo mobile app ads, uh, web page banner ads, and homepage takeovers. Next slide. Now, uh, this is uh, the number of impressions that we received this year just from the Maricopa County Air Quality Department's social media platforms, that is, uh, LinkedIn, Google, Nextdoor, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. As you can see this year, we gained two, over 2 million impressions as opposed to the previous year, which was 75,000 uh, or around 76,000. Uh, you can see the breakdown in this slide for each of the platforms. Um, we did something, um, we added two components, which were a, like I said, target audience and Google ads. These were extra beneficial for us this campaign because we were able to see when, where, and what um, the public searches for no burn days. So we will use this data for future campaigns and move forward using um, social media platform posts. Uh, not only are they often free, but we've also paid for some advertising on these platforms. And as you can see this year really paid off uh, to do that and to have continuous posting. Next slide. Uh, we've also, as we've done in the past, uh, had uh, many partners uh, helping us promote this campaign. This is a list of only a few of them. Uh, we're really grateful to our partners because they have really um, increased the, the promotion and the awareness of Burn Cleaner, Burn Better campaign. Um, Bashes and Food City stores, um, not only did they promote on their newsletters and ads, they also did digital streaming on their cash registers. 
So that really helped um, dispel the message of what, what it means to burn on a no burn day and the effects of smoke um, in air pollution in Maricopa County. Next slide. So really quickly, um, campaign earned more than, actually it was 32 million. We just received numbers from BASHAs um, and we hadn't taken those into account. So it, it really helped us to promote with them, not only with them, but with our other partners, City of Phoenix, City of Scottsdale, and we had help from Amanda McGinnis and uh, Steve Trussell, et cetera. So we were really grateful this year for those partnerships, including Valley Metro. Uh, we were able to have a light rail wrap um, run in the month of December. Um, the track targeted audience impressions through campaign engagement in Maricopa County only meant that this time around, we were sure that these uh, impressions were uh, the public actually engaged so it wasn't just an ad that ran and maybe someone left and wasn't paying attention uh, these were tracked by clicks and um, interaction um, again we relied heavily on digital streaming over the top streaming um, and social media um, so moving forward we will continue to partner with um, the Clean Air Council, um, uh, businesses, and really focus on the, the digital aspect of these campaigns as they show that they have worked effectively. Um, uh, this time around, I, I know we don't wanna take credit for it. We can't take credit for the weather, but we only experienced one smoke exceedance um, during the run of this campaign. Next slide. So thank you, and thank you to everyone that collaborated in this campaign. If you guys have any questions, you can reach me. Um, here's my information, and I will take any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Do we have any questions from the committee? Okay, well, if you think of any uh, after this meeting, there's her contact information. So. Thank you very much again for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, for agenda item number five, update on the 2022 Serious Area Particulate Plan for the West Pinal County Non-Attainment Area, a uh, presentation by Matt Poppin of the Maricopa Association of Government. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, today, I really wanna provide what I hope will be um, one of the last updates on this plan as the plan is largely complete. Uh, there's a few uh, small items we're still waiting some feedback on, but for the most part, the modeling has been complete. Uh, we're just in the process of assembling the, the documents for the plan and getting it ready to go to uh, public notice for the 30-day comment period. So what I wanted to do today um, because I know the committee has seen quite a few of these updates and we appreciate all the uh, attention the committee has given this plan and their input. Today will be an overview of everything that is included in the plan. Um, and uh, we'll give you uh, at the end some next steps of where the plan is headed. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just so we can set the context, we know that the area was first designated non-attainment um, back in May 31st, 2012, as a moderate area. In response to that, ADEQ prepared a moderate area plan um, to meet the requirements and submitted that to EPA on December 21st, 2015. At that time, the attainment date for the non-attainment area was December 31st, 2018. Um, and then in June 24th, 2020, EPA published a final rule to determine that the non-attainment area had failed to meet the PM standard by that attainment date. And that was based upon monitoring data from 2016 through 2018. And with that uh, determination, the area was reclassified as a serious non-attainment area as a um, function of law. Um, the serious area plan is due within 18 months of the reclassification date, which is January 24th, 2022. So we are a few months behind on that due date. Next slide. Some additional regulatory actions that we wanna make you aware of that have bearing on the plan that occurred um, after the area was bumped up to Sirius. 
Um, so on January 8th, 2021, EPA published a rule to approve in part and disapprove, uh, disapprove in part the 2015 uh, West Pinal moderate area plan that was submitted by ADEQ. Um, shortly after that, EPA also published a limited approval and limited disapproval of, of a SIP revision regarding some of the agricultural best management practices that were uh, designed to meet moderate non-attainment area requirements. So as a result of these two actions, on May 17, 2021, ADEQ withdrew that uh, West Pinal moderate PM10 non-attainment area plan. Next slide. So with the withdrawal of the plan, um, EPA published a finding of failure to submit a moderate area plan, and that was effective as of August 23rd, 2021. With that effective date, some uh, sanctions clock are, are now ticking as a result of that failure to submit. So the first possible sanction would occur February 23rd, 2023, if a, if a, a, moderate, if a complete moderate area plan is not submitted and that is the emissions offset sanctions for um, stationary sources. Um, the second sanction uh, would be August 23rd, 2023, and that's imposition of highway sanctions if the state does not submit a complete moderate area plan. And then lastly, on that same date, EPA could also promulgate a federal implementation plan or a FIP if EPA does not approve the state's moderate area plan submission. Now, EPA has indicated to us that submission of a complete serious area PM10 plan, which uh, is the goal of this 2022 particular plan, uh, that addresses all of the moderate area requirements and the serious area requirements will turn off the sanctions clock. So EPA approval of a complete uh, plan will also um, stop the promulgation of a FIP. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to the background, again, here's the map of the non-attainment area. You can see it's located primarily in the western portion of Pinal County. Um, there are uh, eight um, PM10 monitors located within the non-attainment area. Um, however, that Coolidge monitor was discontinued at the end of 2019. So currently there are only seven PM10 monitor monitoring stations operating. Next slide. So here is a depiction of the uh, monitor data at those individual stations. Um, and these are uh, the count of exceedance days at each monitor uh, by year. Um, so you can see at the bottom, we've got five years, uh, 2016 through 2020. And each of the monitoring stations is, is listed there by name. Um, the gray colored bar represents what we are calling um, standard exceedances, and the dashed yellow bar are what we're calling high wind dust event exceedances. So the high wind dust event exceedances are those exceedances where sustained wind speeds were above 25 miles per hour, which would make those exceedances um, eligible for submission as an exceptional event, and it would not count against the region. Um, the uh, the stand, what we're calling standard exceedances were either either occurred under low wind conditions or uh, wind speeds that weren't elevated or high enough to be considered an exceptional event. Um, so you can see that the majority of the exceedances in uh, most of the years have occurred at the Hidden Valley Monitor. And in fact, um, when you look at uh, 2016 through 2018 data, um, and you remove those high wind dust events, if you assume those are indeed exceptional events, there were only three monitors that are violating the PM10 standard. That's Hidden Valley, Pinal County Housing, and Stanfield. The other five monitors um, had less than four exceedances in that period, um, so those were already meeting the standard. Um, and that trend really continues as you look uh, through uh, 19 and 20. 2019 was the best year so far. It was a very wet, rainy year, so that really helped a lot. Um, in 2021, the, the monitoring data is uh, still um, preliminary, so we're not showing it there, but it's pretty similar to 2020, although there are uh, less exceedances at Hidden Valley. I believe there are around 20 or 20, I believe 24 exceedances at Hidden Valley in 2021. So those trends you're seeing in 19 and 20 um, are pretty much continuing in 2021. Next slide, please. 
so because we have all those exceedances of the um, PM10 standard at the Hidden Valley Monitor, we are unable to make the, attain the serious area attainment date, which is December 31st, 2022, um, because you have to have three years of clean data, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2021, or 2020 is already above uh, the maximum allowable exceedances, so there's no way to make that attainment date. Because of that, um, an extension of the serious area attainment date will be included as part of the plan. Um, and the Clean Air Act does allow that if a couple conditions are met. One, you have to show that attainment by December 31st is impracticable, which is pretty straightforward. We can show that. You have to show that compliance with all existing requirements and commitments and, and prior plans are, are being followed through with and that the plan has to include the most stringent measures that are included in any plan or state and that are achieved in practice in any state. Um, so based on that, the plan, uh, our attainment modeling is showing that we can attain by December 31st, 2026. Um, so a that's a four year extension of the deadline. So a request to extend the uh, deadline to December 31st, 2026 will be included in the serious area plan. Next slide. Um, let's take a look at what the emissions look like for the base year. Again, EPA recommended recommended selecting a base year between 2016 and 2018. Uh, those were the, the years that the monitoring data was used to bump the area up from moderate to serious. So 2017 was selected as the base year. Uh, the base year only includes direct emissions of PM10. Uh, this is because MAG was able to show through a weight of evidence analysis that PM10 precursor pollutants like ammonia, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, and volatile organic compounds do not significantly contribute to exceedance of the PM10 standard in the non-attainment area. And because of that, um, they don't need to be included as part of the uh, base year inventory. And again, this base year inventory uh, was developed with inputs from ADEQ, Pinal County Air Quality Control District, and MAG. Next slide, please. So here's a pie chart of the uh, 2017 base year annual PM10 emissions inventory that uh, is included in the plan. Um, this is annual emissions. So the total annual emissions for the year is 41,168 tons per year. You can see that the majority of emissions on an annual basis come from unpaved roads, whether that be public roads or private roads or, or agricultural commercial farm roads, um, and uh, some other larger categories are windblown dust, which is approximately 9% of the inventory. Um, some of the tilling and harvesting operations are 5%. Uh, feedlots and dairies together are around 3.5%, a little bit more. And then some of the other sources um, uh, represent uh, fill out that rest of the pie chart. To the right of the pie chart, we have a breakdown of what's included in that 3,705 tons of windblown dust. So these are the land uses that contribute um, to windblown dust. So you can see the majority of the windblown dust is coming from desert areas, about half of it. Um, half of that tonnage is from desert areas, and then there's a mixture of what we're calling commercial, industrial, and public uh, land uses. Um, these land uses have a mix of buildings and unpaved parking lots, so they, they do have areas that um, are subject to creating windblown dust. We have construction sites, uh, cropland where crops are actively growing, dairy and feedlots, uh, large open area employments. These are things like sand and gravel pits and landfills where the majority of the area is open to the wind. Um, what's kind of unique about Pinal County is many of the low density single family lots are large in size, um, one to two acres. And so they have a lot of land that is sometimes available to um, create windblown dust as well. And we have unpaved roads and then vacant land. So vacant land is land that, um, what distinguishes it from desert, it is land that has either been developed or is slated to be developed. So um, it usually has a little bit more disturbance on it than does natural desert. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, 
One of the things the committee helped us with is that the serious area plan is required to include best available control measures. This is a requirement for all serious areas. Um, EPA defines um, for all the significant sources of PM10. So EPA defines a significant source of PM10 as those that contribute five micrograms or more to a violation of the PM10 standard. Um, those significant sources of PM10 were initially um, identified in the 2015 West Canal Moderate Area Plan. Um, the attainment modeling that was done for this plan uh, confirmed those um, initial um, significant sources and did not identify any new significant sources. Um, so no new sources were added and those um, other sources were still deemed to be significant sources that were previously identified. Um, BACM is required to be implemented no later than four years after the reclassification date, which is July 24, 2024. So the commitments that we received from the Agricultural Best Management Practices Committee and the Pinal County Board of Supervisors, those uh, will need to be implemented no later than July 24, 2024. Next slide, please. So if you remember, Trinity Consultants, uh, MAG hired uh, consulted with them uh, to complete an analysis of BACM and MSM. Um, we had them um, canvas 10, either current existing serious PM10 non-attainment areas or areas that were formerly PM10 non-attainment areas that are now maintenance areas uh, to look for best available controls and most stringent measures at the same time. And that report came up with 70 candidate measures for uh, the committee to consider. Um, those 70 measures were evaluated to determine uh, the emission reductions associated with them and the technological and economic feasibility of implementing each of the measures. Next slide. So those 70 measures um, were identified and they were included in a draft suggested list of measures to reduce PM10 in the, in the non-attainment area. And then once that um, draft list, list of measures went to uh, the implementing entities, the implementing entities then decide which measures are feasible for them um, to implement. And again, the, for, uh, for the non-attainment area, there are two main implementing entities. It's the Pinal County Air Quality Control District and the Governor's Agricultural Best Management Practices Committee. And the MAG Regional Council did approve that draft suggested list of measures on May 26, 2021. Next slide, please. As a result of that, um, we did receive commitments to implement those measures. Uh, MAG uh, sent out a model resolution package to help the implementing entities uh, prepare their resolutions and commitments. Um, so we did receive on July 28th commitments from the Governor's Agricultural Best Management Practices Committee and on August 4th, 2021, the Pinal County Board of Supervisors passed a res resolution to commit to implementing BACM and MSM from the suggested list. A total of 61 out of the 70 suggested measures were committed to. Next slide, please. So as a result of those commitments, uh, we calculated what the emissions would be in 2026, which is the attainment year. So here's the pie chart for 2026 based on annual emissions. Uh, the total is 34,016 uh, tons per year. And again, that's a reduction from uh, approximately 41,000 tons. We're getting about a 7,000 ton reduction from the 2017 base year inventory. Uh, the distribution of sources is largely similar. Um, so uh, the pie chart distribution percentages are, are pretty similar. Uh, but there is a significant reduction in emissions as a result of committing to implement those measures. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, once we have the uh, measures committed to, we can begin to do the attainment modeling. So MAG also contracted with Trinity Consultants to, to uh, perform the attainment modeling. And the attainment modeling was done for eight design days at three monitoring sites that violate the standard, as we've discussed before. Hidden Valley, Pinal County Housing, and Stanfield. Those eight design days were designed to meet all of the types of conditions that lead to exceedances in the non-attainment area. So there were low wind design days and elevated wind design days. Um, attainment modeling was performed using a combination of the EPA air mod dispersion model 
for the low wind activity based PM10 concentrations. And then emissions rollback was used for uh, for elevated wind and wind blown dust PM10 concentrations and hours. So for those monitors that we did not select design dates for, basically the other five monitors within the region, EPA Region 9 guidance recommended that we simply show that those non-violating monitors be addressed by describing whether the emissions inventory that each monitor are expected to increase or decrease and how that would affect their future attainment status. So we can see from the 2026 pie chart that emissions are decreasing across the non-attainment area. So emissions will also be decreasing at these five other monitors. Um, so that helps us to show that not only are we demonstrating attainment at the three model monitors, but that attainment will be achieved throughout the non-attainment area due to the reductions in emissions that we're seeing. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a summary of the design days um, that were included. So there were four days at Hidden Valley because Hidden Valley had the most exceedances. We wanted, ca we wanted to capture the two seasons where, where um, most of the exceedances occur, which are summer and fall. So there's a, um, a summer day, low wind day, and a fall low wind day. And then we also wanted to capture the two types of wind events that generally cause exceedances, whether it be a kind of passing low pressure system or a cold front, and then also, of course, the thunderstorm events. Um, and again, these would be um, days when winds were, were elevated to cause windblown dust, but not high enough to be considered an exceptional event. So we had four days at Hidden Valley. We had one day at Pinal County Housing Monitor because it was really close to attaining already. And then we had three days at the Stanfield Monitor. Um, you can see the highest uh, day that was um, evaluated was July 6, 2018. I had a concentration of 261 micrograms per cubic meter, and the standard is 150. Um, one of the other things EPA wanted us to include was to make sure we had the fourth highest overall day out of the region, and that day is the fourth highest out of that three-year period of 2016 through 2018 when you remove um, high wind uh, exceptional events. Next slide, please. So here are the results of the attainment modeling. So when you uh, apply the controls, um, you can see that all of the days are showing attainment of the standard. Again, all of the um, concentrations are below the standard, which is 150 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, we also wanted to make sure that this was the quickest we could attain. Originally, we were, um, showed some information to the committee uh, showing results of 2027, um, which also uh, showed attainment. Um, we can show attainment in 2026 as well based on emission reductions. They're not as much as what occurs in 2027, but they're still significant enough to um, demonstrate attainment. Um, another reason why 2026 is the earliest that we can show attainment is this will be the first uh, uh, period where we'll have three full years of all of those new BACM and MSM controls being implemented. So 2024 is the first year when all of those BACM and MSM controls are expected to be fully implemented. So we'll have 2024, 2025, and 2026 of full implementation. Um, so that should give us, uh, you know, no more than four exceedances in that three-year period each monitor uh, to allow us to, to meet the standard. We didn't think we could meet it in 2025 because we weren't getting the benefits of all of those measures. Um, so 2026 was, was shown to be the quickest we could attain. Next slide, please. A couple other uh, items that are included in the plan are reasonable further progress. So reasonable further progress is a requirement of the Clean Air Act. And basically what it requires is that you show a continuous decrease in PM10 emissions throughout the non-attainment area, area uh, starting with your base year until your attainment year and even beyond your attainment year. So our base year is 2017, our attainment year is 2026. And so we also showed um, reasonable further progress calculations for 2027 to show that emissions will continue to decrease past the attainment year. Um, as part of the reasonable further progress requirements, uh, 
The CLEANER Act also uh, requires quantitative milestones, which are to be achieved every three years until the area is redesignated attainment. So discussions are, this is one piece that discussions are still ongoing with EPA in terms of what are the most appropriate selection of RFP milestone years. What those discussions are centering on is uh, we agree largely that there needs to be a milestone year for the attainment year, which would be 2026, and then one um, that represents kind of when controls are implemented, whether it be 2023 or 2024. But there is some discussion about whether there should be milestones earlier for years that have already passed in order to kind of help show that those moderate area requirements are being met that have been withdrawn. So we're still discussing with EPA on whether there will be some of those prior milestone years included as well. Next slide. So here's a graph of reasonable further progress. You can see there's the base year uh, emissions inventory uh, total of 41,168 tons in 2017. And you can see that the um, moderate area controls, which are the controls that are currently in place, um, provide um, continued emission reductions through 2021. And then 2022 is when some of those best available control measures and most stringent measures kick in. And that's why you see kind of a steep drop there. And then you see another drop in 2024. That's when uh, all of the uh, best available controls and most stringent measures are expected to come online. Um, so that's why you see uh, little steeper drops in those in those years. But overall, we're showing a downward, uh, consistent downward reduction in emissions as required by the Act. Next slide. Lastly, this is a new item to talk with uh, the committee about contingency measures. Um, EPA requires that um, the area has a contingency measure in case the area fails to make attain attainment by the attainment date or fails to make reasonable further progress. Um, EPA recommends that contingency measures provide emission reductions equivalent to one year's average increment of RFP. So based on that uh, RFP graph we, we showed you earlier, one year's average increment is 794.62 tons. So in order to meet the contingency measure requirement, these are above and beyond all of the BACM and MSM measures that have already been committed to. Um, we have to have another measure or measures that will um, equal that reduction um, in 2027. Next slide. So um, in order to meet that requirement on January 19th, 2022, the Pinal County Board of Supervisors passed a resolution committing to implement a contingency measure if triggered, to reduce the speed limit on public unpaved roads from 25 miles per hour to 15 miles per hour. So the good news with this is that the PM10 emission reductions from implementation of this measure is equal to 950.81 tons in 2027. So that exceeds the requirement of one year's average increment. So this contingency measure passed by the Pinal County Board of Supervisors uh, meets our, our our need for contingency measures. Next slide, please. Okay, lastly, what are the next steps? So in addition to um, the discussions regarding reasonable further progress, there is one area we're still talking with EPA about, and that's regarding the conformity budget um, that will be included in the plan. So we're still uh, ironing out some details with EPA on that. Uh, Trinity Consultants is preparing the, the draft plan as we have it currently. And uh, once complete, that plan will be available for a 30-day public review period and a response to comments received will be prepared. Our hope is that that plan will be completed in March, um, towards the beginning of March here in the next few weeks, and it will go out for, for public comment over uh, mid-March to mid-April. And that means we can come back to the Air Committee in April and ask the Air Committee to make a recommendation on the plan after after we ever uh, developed a response to any comments that um, we may have received. So um, hopefully at the April Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee is when the committee would make a recommendation to uh, recommend the plan to the MAG Management Committee and then ultimately for MAG Regional uh, Council adoption in May. And after that, the plan can be submitted to ADQ and EPA. 
So thank you again, committee, for all of your patience and hard work and input on the plan. I appreciate it. And I'm available for any comments or questions that the committee may have. This is Liz Foster, uh, Maricopa County Farm Bureau. I have a question about your 2026 projections. Does that take into account um, cropland that's going to be fallowed or taken out of production because of the water shortage? Or are you just uh, the numbers based on same amount of acreage as we have right now? No, good question, Liz. We did reach out to the Ag BMP committee and they provided us projections on what they thought the reductions would be. So currently, we estimated or ADEQ gave us estimations that for the base year, the percentage of fallow land is approximately 11% of, um, of current crop acreage. AD, uh, the Ag BNP committee recommended we use a, per, uh, a percentage of 25% for those future attainment years of 2026 and 2027. So those emissions do reflect um, uh, fields, uh, fallow field percentage of 25% of total, uh, total area. Thank you. Hey, Matt, this is Scott Tobias with Pinal County. Um, in regards to your ongoing discussions with EPA on the RFP increments, are there any tentative plans moving forward to have some type of, um, periodic emissions inventory effort, similar to what they do in Maricopa County to quantify, to officially quantify the emissions within the non-attainment area? Right, part of, thank you, Scott. Um, part of the um, requirements, once those milestones are set, is there is a requirement to have a milestone report uh, prepared. And so, for example, if a milestone for 2023 is prepared then approximately 90 days after 2023 a report to epa is due showing what the emissions were and whether that rfp milestone was met so um, um you know work will have to continue kind of how it how it was developed for development of the inventory so we'll work with Pinal county air quality control district and adeq and, and mag uh, to come up with the emissions that will be used for the milestone report. Um, in terms of a periodic inventory, there really isn't, the PM10 standard doesn't require a, uh, an official periodic inventory like the ozone standard does every three years. Um, so really what is required is the uh, milestone reports. And then of course, if there's a new, a new plan or a new revision, then a new inventory would have to be done. Uh, but there isn't a requirement to do a, a periodic emissions inventory every three years. Um, so uh, beyond the NEI, which is county-based, right? National emissions inventory is a county inventory, not a non-attainment area inventory. So really the requirements that will need to be addressed are those for whatever milestone dates are, are selected. And if milestone dates are selected for prior years, we would simply use the calculations that are currently included in the plan. Um, because they represent the best available data we have on those. So if we have to include a milestone for 2017 and 2020, we'll simply use the emissions that are already in the plan. So that's kind of where we are with that. Another follow-up question, Matt, with, from Scott here. Um, the reason for that question is more or less just for offsets, um, having a quantifiable emissions inventory. Um, something that's documented so that if and when the time comes and we need to do some type of offset rule, um, we would have something to back it up and something for some, you know, potential uh, source to use. And as it stands currently, we don't have that. So that's where that's where that question comes from. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, hearing none, we will move on to agenda item number six. Thank you, Matt, for your presentation. Um, agenda item number six is the tentative meeting schedule for the MAG Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee. Um, Julie Hoffman with Maricopa Association of Governments. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. The 2022 Air Quality Technical Advisory Committee meeting schedule has been prepared and we included it in your agenda packet again this month for your convenience. Thank you. 
Thank you, Julie. Okay, our agenda item number seven is a request for future agenda items. If there are any topics or issues of interest um, that the committee would like to, to have presented, um, are there any requests by the membership for a future agenda item? Okay, hearing none. Um, oh, go ahead, was there? Madam Chair, yes. this, is, this is Amanda McGinnis from the Associated General Contractors. And I apologize, I did not catch it on the minutes at the beginning of the meeting, but I was noted as absent for that meeting and I was present for the December 16th meeting. I did send Lisa an email. Okay, I'll ask Mag staff, do we need to do a new motion with an amendment for that administrative change to the minutes for December 16th? Madam Chair, this is Lisa Young. Yeah. Um, before we make a motion for this, I would like to verify the information, please. Okay. Very good. Um, okay, well, with that, um, again, agenda item number seven was for any future agenda items. And so if you think of anything, you can always reach out to Max staff if there's none um, on the call today. And with that, we can move to uh, adjournment. So business is now concluded. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? This is John Cheryl, so moved. Thank you, John. Have a great afternoon, everyone.